Hi, and welcome to this podcast. Uh, my name is Rodrigo Flamenco, and I am the host of the Level Up podcast, which is meant to level up your business, life, and your mind. Please click the subscribe button and the notification icon. It will help us a lot. The thing that I want to do here is make this as an introductory episode. So this is not going to be very large. Uh, this is going to be very quick. I just want to make an introduction of myself about what I want to do with this podcast. Pretty much uh, the goal that I have for this and my experience so you can understand a little bit more about where I am coming from. Uh, so first starters, I am from a third world country called El Salvador. If you have, if you are the type of person that watches the news a lot, you will see that El Salvador is not like the best place to start the business. However, I figured out about online entrepreneurship, how to create your business online, pretty much using all the systems to create a profitable business. And I decided to implement it on my own. And through my experience, I helped a lot of failures, a lot of wins, uh, things that I never even expected to happen in the first place. And I want to be able to provide this experience to all of you and to be able to have a little bit more freedom to kind of explore more deeply topics that I'm usually not being able to explore. So first of all, a little bit about my history. Again, uh, com coming from El Salvador uh, wasn't the best experience ever. It was uh, I was my last job was as an IT engineering, uh, working for uh, six hundred and fifty dollars a month salary, which is not much if you live in a first world country. And believe me, it's not much living here either. So there is that. Uh, I was also twenty thousand dollars in debt when I started. Pretty much, I didn't have this kind of uh, a starting point that many entrepreneurs have, which is like, oh, I'm looking for my dreams. So I'm, I'm chasing for what makes me happy, uh, what makes me live an inspired life. No, I didn't have any. <laughs> pretty much, I didn't have any of that. I, I started out out of complete desperation. And I'm going to try to be as brutally honest as possible here. One of the first things that uh, at the moment when I was starting joining on the entrepreneurship was a very depressive state of mind. And I was at my wit's sense. Uh, pretty much I have worked a lot. I work really, really hard to kind of reach this point in my career where I wanted, where I could work in this company, which was one of the best companies in my country, which is not saying a lot, to be honest, right now that I look back. But at the moment, it felt like this huge achievement. And I worked really hard. And in a matter of five years, I was able to get into that job. And that job allowed me to watch all the other best companies of this country and what they had to offer. As I was an IT engineer, I had to go to these companies to kind of provide tech support to certain technologies. And what I saw pretty much was very disappointing. Uh, I, I found out this ceiling, uh, this limit that was not being able to be crossed. Uh, one of the things that I, one of the reasons why I wanted to be uh, an IT tech is because uh, usually, if you, especially if you work in networks, uh, you get this point where everything is working fine and you don't do anything. And you can use this free time to learn a lot of things, to do a lot of stuff. Um, and then obviously when things go bad, then you get really busy and, and it can be really stressful and all these things, but you have these ups and downs, like it's either completely hellish or it's like very relaxing, but it, there is almost no in between. That being said, uh, what ended up happening is that uh, I realized that that didn't happen in this country. Uh, what was happening was that uh, we had this problem that pretty much everybody was being exploited, <laughs> just to be honest. And I saw the people like the the levels of salaries that they have, where they have 
uh, for example, if you pass the $1,000 a month salary, you will have a lot of work. Like for the people who have $2,000 salaries, $2,000 salaries uh, a month and or beyond, they barely had any life. So pretty much, they barely saw their families. They had to work really late, and and that was crazy for me because I was thinking like, holy shit, like this is not too much. Like this is not that two thousand dollars a month is not that much, and and these people are destroying their lives. And I didn't knew anything else, so uh, that was pretty disappointing. I ended up getting into another company that uh, that was a little bit more relaxed, but I was sitting there like thinking something was wrong with me. And because I saw like even in this new company that I that I jumped to, everybody was happy. Uh, everybody was happy to be there. Everybody was just content of doing the job that they had to do. And I remember going out to take a little bit of water to drink a little bit of water and they had this poster right in in front of everybody about for the anniversaries of the employees and i saw positions there that were being celebrated because they have 35 years old into the into the company 40 years old into the company and you read the position and you knew that this person pretty much had entered into this position and had been doing the same thing for the last 20 25 30 40 50 years and when i read that like some something went completely terrified inside of me i i actually had goosebumps and I remember thinking like this is not what I want to do, <laughs> and the thing is that they had this anniversary shit because they wanted to show other employees like, hey, you have like uh, something secure here, you have something stable, like you can last for 40 years, and I could see that that was what most people wanted, but that I didn't want that. Like I, I, I just couldn't understand, and it was really frustrating because. Everybody seems so happy, and I and here I was like being depressed at this kind of life, and and thinking like there must be something wrong with me, and this is something that in the book the Kaibalian, the Kaibalian or something like that it's called it's weird it's a very weird name but it's a really good book. Uh, they talk about that the teacher comes when the student is ready, so I think that that depression made me be ready to receive the lessons. And I was, uh, through following certain people online, I was able to stumble in the four hour work week by Tim Ferriss. I read the book, uh, I thought it was amazing. I pretty much started looking for proof that it could happen and I found it. And I remember I spent the next uh, six months like going deep into that, trying to find more proof, trying to make sure that this wasn't a scam or something like that. And at the end of the day, it was like, okay, uh, I have this path here, and you can choose to try to test this thing, or you can choose to do nothing and pretty much stay and see what happens. So I choose to do something, and I even like the the position was so bad, <laughs> so bad that I remember thinking, well, I'm going to give my everything into this. And if this doesn't work, then I'm going to commit suicide because I don't want to live this life. I don't want to spend another 40 years uh, doing this kind of life. And luckily for me, <laughs> that path paid out. Uh, first, I started a business doing web design and app development that lasted for about three years. Then a couple of opportunities came and, and I was able to partner up with a friend that I had from college. And we started an animation studio called Frame Freak Studio. And this is the thing that went really, really, really well. <laughs> it took a it took a bit. But I remember being like in this position because I started working in these two companies, and then there was this moment where Frame Freak Studio wasn't given any money, but I saw the potential into this, and then I saw a big web studio which was giving me money but not that much. And at the end, I took the risk 
close Epic Web Studio, did a little bit of testing with that, but I decided to close it. Went to Frame Freak Studio, full into it, even though it wasn't giving any money at all. <laughs> and, but that was only that for about three months. And now, here's a fun thing. Uh, when we joined, it wasn't called Frame Freak Studio. We didn't have a name, we didn't have a website, we didn't have anything. I just saw uh, we were getting results without having anything to show for. So that was the, the first thing that tipped me off, that there was a lot of potential into this. So I went right in and there were things, there were projects that we were getting involved that we didn't knew how to do. And I started a similar format to this. To be honest, this is my first time blogging in about three years, I think. So I'm a little bit rusty. I apologize for that. If you think I'm being a little bit weird, but um, out of practice. That being said, uh, I joined completely into doing this. And we took some projects that were over 30K dollars and pretty much we didn't know how to do them. In fact, we didn't know anything much about the industry that we just signed up. That was uh, professional animation. So I decided to do exactly this thing, uh, interview people, which I have a, uh, a podcast before called the, the Hustlers Show or something like that. I, I cannot remember where very well. So I did a little bit of spin off of that name and put it the Creative Hustler Show, which is this logo that we have over here. And I remember finding a, a project that was very similar to ours in Kickstarter and that almost made a million dollars. So I decided to pretty much email the guy who did it and and see if he was open to be interviewed. And the thing is that he answered and he said yes. And at the time, I didn't know who he was. And when I started looking who he was, uh, my mind blew up. <laughs> it completely blew up because this guy was Fred Seibert. Now, if you do not know who this guy is, uh, I don't blame you. I didn't know either. And I was in the same industry as him. But to give his resume, he was the first creative director of MTV when he was good back in the 80s. Then he was the last president of Hanna-Barbera. So if you saw the Flintstones, the Jetsons, the Jetsons, something like that, uh, then you know about his work. Then he joined to create uh, this uh, incubator called What a Cartoon in Cartoon Network or Cartoon Cartoon. Don't remember very well what was it. But pretty much he through that program, shows like Duster Laboratory, The Powerpuff Girls, Johnny Bravo, uh, Cowan Chicken, uh, The Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy, Samurai Jack, all these shows came to life through that uh, incubator. And then he founded his own production company, which was responsible for the fairly good par well, the fairly old parents and also Adventure Time. And he produced as well with Kendi Tartkovsky the last the last season of Samurai Jack, and I don't. I think he's doing a Steven Universe, not completely sure, but no, I think that wasn't it. But still, like this guy is a beast. <laughs> he said yes to my email. And I was like, wow, I cannot believe it. Then he said yes. And I went into that interview very being very afraid, like very nervous, because he, here was this guy who has produced a lot of the series that I watched as a kid. I admire him a lot. And then I was thinking like Man, I, I, this was a hit for me because I was thinking, like, I got already got the skills. But I realized at that point that if I had knew who he was, I wouldn't have sent that email. Because I would have thought, like, oh, man, like, he's too big. He's not going to accept. Like, I'm just a guy from a third world country, from a small studio that doesn't even have a name yet. And he said yes. And then I start send another invitation to Stephen Silver, who uh, work in, in a, I think, in the Fairly Old Parents as well, in Danny Phantom, in, in Kim Possible. Uh, he's a, the director of character design in Disney. And and pretty much he said yes as well. And I was, my mind was blown. And then I kept trying and kept trying and kept trying. And now we have 83 
uh, interviews done through that podcast with the best, the absolute best of the animation industry, and I plan on keeping on keeping that going. So we're very close to episode 100 now, and and that keeps me excited. But the thing is that as I was pretty much interviewing these guys, I started to see certain principles that made people uh, function in these kind of environments when you produce amazing projects. And I started tying it with the things that I knew from entrepreneurship. And also the thing about uh, interviewing creatives is that they are usually artists. They are not that much businessmen. So some of them will have amazing knowledge, but then you will go into some big guy or a bigger into the animation industry expecting to have great knowledge. And then you find out that they only have a name and the reason why they keep having a a job or, or getting amazing work is because they are already famous and they keep getting being uh, looked for. And that is hard because <laughs> Uh, Sometimes I go very excited thinking like I'm going to learn something from somebody and that doesn't happen sometimes. But on the other hand as well, sometimes appears people that just simply blow your mind. And the thing is that since the Creative Hospital show is something that is very focused to people in illustration, animation industries, things like that, like this is very focused on the creative industry. And the creative industries right now is a very political thing. This is something that, to be honest, I don't, I don't like. Uh, when it comes to work, when it comes to my projects, I just want to be able to focus on the projects. I don't want to focus on politics. I am not uh, either right wing or left wing, or nor I care, to be honest. <laughs> so uh, I, I just want to be free from that and to be able to do work as pretty much using most common sense. <laughs> if something works, I like to do it, as simple as that. So that being said, uh, there has been some creative freedoms. There have been some paths that I want to explore, ideas that I want to talk about, uh, ideas that I want to other the help from other people to develop them into something better. And this show wasn't giving me that. Uh, there there is some kind of limitations over here people that i would like to interview that again on the creative side i cannot interview because maybe this guy are in politics or or they are a figure right now very famous in politics and i don't want to interview them about their politics i want to interview them about the principles that help them to get uh a solid foot or solid feet, they're a solid foundation in order for them to stand and be able to take all this pressure. And this is an idea that came from the my very first days from being an entrepreneur because I had the luck to get into a group with Nilo Strauss, which is an amazing writer. Is if, if you do not know about Nilo Strauss, then I recommend you uh Read his books. Emergency is a good one. Uh, the game is another good one. Uh, he has a lot of amazing books. Pretty much everything that he produces becomes a, uh, a New York Times best-selling book. Anyways, I had a lot to kind of be in a mastermind group with him, and my very first class was about how to handle stress. And. <laughs> Being a noob, being a completely noob in entrepreneurship, I went there thinking like, oh man, like they are going to teach us how to deal with stress in the office and, and things like that. And what Neil had done was that this guy got, uh, I don't remember what was his name, but he was the guy who was in charge of the rescue operation during Hurricane Katrina. This is a guy who has a company that let's say if the u.s army is fighting somewhere on the other side of the world and they have lost a convoy and they want to save them because they know that they are still alive and they don't know how to save them without sending other soldiers to be killed they call this guy so his company can go and rescue these guys so 
imagine the kind of stress that this guy has to have like the the kind of stress that this guy has to deal with and that and when you compare that to the stress that we have in an office in, in a job in a business a creator or business things like that that is nothing <laughs> But 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 here's the thing, like, uh, and I have created one of my first posts in the in my blog, RodrigoFlamenco.com, that focuses a little bit on this because this is something I, I wasn't able to articulate this until recently, but I was always caught to this kind of really harsh situations, let's call it, like these really kind of desperate, really hard situations. And the thing is that uh, pretty much what I saw was that there was some lessons to be learned there in those situations that most people do not want to explore. And again, only recently I was able to be able to put this into words, but it's by a quote of Jordan Peterson who says that, why do we want to look at the darker situations? And the reason why we want to look at those situations is because in the darker situations is where we can find what still shine. And if it can shine, if it can work in the absolute worst of situations, then you know for certain that you have a true light, that you have a principle that is absolutely true. And this is something that, when I first heard it, it really stuck and kind of put everything together in my head. Because again, for many years, I was being called a pessimist, that uh, I was being called a little bit dramatic even because I tend to focus on the worst things. Like I like to think like the worst case scenarios. Like I expect doing great things, but I, I also prepare for the worst scenarios. And this is a lesson that I learned from Tim Ferriss. He calls it uh, pragmatic pessimism, which is like you go into a plan expecting the absolute best, but you prepare for the worst. So that if the worst happens, you are already prepared. And I don't remember, I think it was Seneca who said that uh, he who prepares uh, for the problems before they arrive takes his their power away when they arrive. And so this is a, the thing that I like to study a lot, like the principles that can work from the absolute worst positions, because if it works in the worst positions, then it can work amazingly when you are in the good times. And the reason why I started to learn these things is because, again, I come from El Salvador and I came from the absolute worst position to start a business. Again, I didn't start a business because of passion. I didn't start a business because I was following my bliss. I didn't start a business because I wanted to find what made me happy. I was building a business because I was absolutely desperate and the only solution that I saw at the moment was either succeed at business or putting a bullet to my head <laughs> and I still have the bullet so well, I should have put it next to me so I could show it to you but it is a good reminder and yeah pretty much there are a lot of lessons that I have learned through the years by studying all these things by reading about other people by watching the interviews and and there has been a desire through making of this show of making a new show where I have more freedom to explore these different paths that can give us amazing lessons that we can use not only about entrepreneurship but to improve our lives, to improve our relationships, to improve our health. And the thing is that as well, like there is a lot to be learned in a lot of areas. And something else that I want to learn as well, this is like a secondary uh, objective of this show, is that uh, we are looking at all these new technologies that we cannot predict how they are going to end. Uh, artificial intelligence is advancing really fast. We have 3D printers who are advancing really fast as well. We have the combination that genetics is a, a, advancing amazingly. and 
if you want to be blown away a little bit by this, like look at what CRISPR is, is C R I P S, I think R. P S R, yes. So CRISPR. If you look for that, you're going to be blown away. And there is even medicines that be, are being developed right now that they claim that they are going to be able to stop us from aging and that they are going to come out in the next seven to ten years. And again, there are some other medicines that are coming out that they are saying that they are going to be able to reverse our age. So you might have the idea is that you might have 50 years old and you will have the body of a 20 years old, which will be a fucking amazing man and the thing is that it's not only those areas to be explored on their own but you have where Rockefeller did way way in the past where he pretty much grabbed the existing technologies that were at the time and put them together and he created a great empire and what we are seeing is that these new technologies are being combined, like robotics is advancing really fast as well. And now you have people creating robotics that are can be 3D printed and they are uploading these, these models into torrents so you can download them and use them in your 3D printer and pretty much produce uh, bionic limbs on a low cost. And you have 3D printers that are being used to create organs that are completely uh, compatible with your body. So you don't have to wait for an organ to be, if you need a transplant, you don't need to wait for an organ. You can get your organ 3D printed based on your DNA and get it inserted into you. Or even that a technology like is being used with this technology of CRISPR and 3D printed and they are doing a lot of amazing things. And if you put into consideration that we will be able to have all these instructions and put it into artificial intelligence and see how that can improve this, uh, these processes and these technologies, then that is going to create something completely different. And that is what, something that I want to explore as well. I want to be able to interview the people who are creating the new technologies and what I'm looking to find is the connections that nobody else can see. Because again, nobody can predict what is going to, what all these new technologies are going to mean. For example, in Free Africa Studio, our business, we produce animation, but now we have virtual reality and augmented reality. And we have this amazing artist called uh, Goro Fujita, who is creating animations doing VR. And he's one of the pioneers. So that is something that is telling me, okay, that this VR thing can be something that kills us because we produce 2D animation. And if, and if you can produce 3D in the same way that you produce 2D, then this is going to change a lot of things. So we have to prepare for that as well. And, and I'm seeing all these kind of new things coming up and I want to be able to explore them as well. So this is going to be a path to discover principles that can be applied for business, for life, uh, to improve our mind as well. And also to explore these new technologies, new, the new things that are coming up and see if we can find a, uh, a weird connection into that that might be can be turned into a business idea and that can help you out too to create your own business idea and I will end this podcast with these two stories that I want to tell you so that you, you have a better idea of what I'm I'm talking about I have this guy uh, his name is Bobe you can find him about using the web nekelius.com and he met this guy in Las Vegas who pretty much was already a millionaire and he came to Las Vegas with very little money so he get he got to Las Vegas and he had this idea like I want to be a millionaire right now so he started going into casinos, going to the luxury ones, uh, trying to meet very rich people there and asking them like, what is it something that you really, really want? What is something that you really, really want to get? 
And eventually, after talking to some guys, there was this guy who told him that he was a collector of watches. And pretty much, this guy wanted a watch that wasn't being produced anymore. That was, uh, and it has haven't been produced for many years now. So it was really hard to find. And he said, okay, interesting. So how much will you give me if I can give that to you? And the guy said, I, I'm willing to give you $10 million if you can find that watch for me. Awesome, he say. And then it, this guy comes, goes to the internet, uh, looks for that watch, look at, looks at the manufacturer, who looks for the CEO in LinkedIn, and which is his, again, this is the most amazing area in the world. Like you can look for everything into into the internet, and and pretty much he was able to get a uh, a meeting with the CEO of this firm, of this company. Then he meets with the CEO, and he's like, "Look, I want to get this watch done. Uh, I want to see if it's possible for you to create one more watch." And the CEO says, like, look, this is going to be really hard because we don't produce that anymore. So producing one of them will mean, like, we will have to get all the equipment out, all molds out, all instructions out. And we will have to put a chunk of our team who is focused right now on creating new watches that are producing us uh, a lot of money into producing just this one watch. So it's not going to be cheap, he says. And and this guy comes and tells him like, look, I'm willing to give you $2 million if you if you can produce this watch. And, they, and the CEO laughs, like really loud, like, <laughs> like, no, you're joking, man. Like, if, if you want us to produce this watch for you, you need to pay us at least $8 million. And he said, deal. They they shook hands. Uh, this guy produced the watch. He got the ten million dollars. He paid the eight million dollars to the other CEO, and now he got the first two million dollars out of that interaction. <laughs> when we heard this tale, it was like, holy shit! Like, <laughs> is that is really that it? Like, but let's be honest. How many of us of us will have come with that idea in the first place? Not many, like, let's be honest, not many. And there is another tale that I know from a guy who was working in the financial sector in the in New York. And this guy was a developer and he was working for a bank. I, I, I If I remember correctly, I think it was Citibank. So, uh, and this was a couple of years ago and they were creating a, pro, a process to Bali, and he noticed that, and this is something that happens a lot with great corporations. Like you have two divisions of the company, and in this case was the the division that validated the credit card charges, and the division uh, that handled all the databases of the of the people who have credit cards. And these divisions are completely separated; they don't have any communication between them. So these guys were doing certain validation by hand. And he, for some reason, he had to go and check some systems into the validation guys and he noticed that. And then he came back to his uh, office in the, IT, uh, in the IT sector and he noticed that this data that they were validating it was into their databases. So he told like, damn, like this could be like, a, a, if you know a little bit about coding, uh, then you must know uh, something that is called if then. So he thought like, okay, this is an instruction that like, if this data is equal to this other data, then the validation is okay. And, and that's it, like it, it was a simple line of code. It's a very simple line of code. So he thought like, man, like this, there is these guys working really hard, uh, validating these all these charges by hand, and we have this information right here in our database. So they don't know, they don't know it. So he goes, he creates the code, offers that code to the to the executives of the bank. They pay them like uh, I think thirty million dollars for that code. 
because that that line of code, like that little code over there, helped them save a lot of money because now the a whole division didn't have to do these tedious validations every day, and this guy just saved a lot of time. But again, like this is not something, this is not an idea that we can get easily because if we do not know the systems of the company, then how the hell are we going to know? And this is that the these three stories uh, pretty much demonstrate the kind of connections that I have been always fascinated with. Like, how can we get this little bit of information over here and combine it with this other area over here and put this together so that can create a solution that nobody has ever thought? And those solutions usually are worth millions of dollars. And for example, one of the posts that I have is that there is this weightlifting program called Strong Lift 5x5. Now, pretty much what happens there is that uh, if you want to grow your muscles really fast or grow your strengths really fast, uh, you only have to do three exercises, but you have to put the most weight that you can lift. And then you have to do uh, five sets of re five repetitions each. Now, if you have put the most weight you can lift, then you can go and do the first five, maybe the second five, and maybe at the, the third set, you go like, okay, I just was able to make four. And the next one, I was only able to do three. And the next one, I was only able to do two. And pretty much you go that for the, uh, for the whole sets in each one of these exercises. Now, once you get, once you are able to lift the whole set and the whole repetitions, the first day that you are able to do that, the next time that you are going to do the lifting, you have to put 10, 10 pounds more and do the lifting. And then you're going to be able to do five, 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 four. <laughs> And then again, like once you are able to do the all the five repetitions and you put 10 pounds more and then again, and I thought like, okay, like, yeah, if for example, something that I, where I had problem like that was in selling because I was afraid of selling. So how can I take, uh, I came with this idea of using that kind of method into selling, into getting comfortable with, with bigger numbers. So I started selling uh, videos at $400 and then $500 and then $600 and then $700 and then way more, way more, way more, way more, way more. And, and right now I have sent a proposal for $25,000 $25, and it's like crossing fingers that comes up. But this happened in a relative short time because I was able to kind of follow that path <laughs> and, and, and my muscles for sales grew really, really fast because I wasn't looking for, I wasn't so much afraid of selling, but I, but so much didn't knew how to tackle it, how to have a system for that. But once I had it, like I was able to go really fast into it. So these are the connections that I'm looking for. This is what the Level Up podcast is all about. And this is what pretty much this YouTube channel, this podcast, uh, this series is going to be focusing all about. So I wanted to make this introductory episode is uh, you can know a little bit more about what I want to do with this, where this is going to go, and also to announce that I already have the first interview with a friend of mine who is killing it over in Australia. So uh, as soon as I have it edited, I'm going to post it up. And pretty much, I really hope that you have liked this introductory episode and that you are accessing access as excited as I am. And if you're into creativity, if you're into art, into illustration, animation, things like that, I definitely recommend that you check or, or another podcast, The Creative Hustler Show. You are going to find amazing lessons from the best artists in the whole world. And yeah, this is something, a way as well to give back to the world that has been good with me because it took a guy who had a $650 per month salary in a third world country with a $20,000 debt 
and put him to make a lot of money creating projects for amazing companies on over 20 countries and meeting many multimillionaires, many uh, Oscar uh, Academy Award winners, Emmy winners, Annie winners, and being able to meet them face to face and learn from them. So I'm really, really thankful for this whole ecosystem, this whole technologies, everything. I know that the many people are trying to push that the world is really screwed up, that everything is going down, is everything is falling apart. But on the other hand, it's for me it's kind of weird because I think like this is the best server of my kind. Like uh, even a person like me can create something big if if they want, if they put the effort, if they put the work, if they put the smart work as well. <laughs> so yeah, and I'm really excited to see what's going what lessons are going to come up from this podcast. So I hope you have liked this first episode. I really hope that you keep uh, following us. And please, if you like it, and if you're watching this in our YouTube channel, please click the like button below and also click the subscribe button and the bell. Or if you're hearing us from the podcast, please subscribe to our podcast and be ready for the next episode. Until next time.